Hi there, this is your new best friend Kevin here with a new show that's sure to rock your socks. It's called Let's Talk About Roguelikes. It's an idea I've been bouncing around in my head for over a year now, and it's about time I did something with it. So this show, Let's Talk About Roguelikes, or LTAR for short, is an in-depth look at games within the roguelike genre and examining their impact both within the genre and the gaming as a whole. It's 50% game review, 50% game theory, and 100% fun. Yeah, that's 200%, but hey, this is my show. I can do that. In LTAR, we're going to be covering a huge array of games, from NetHack, to The Binding of Isaac, to FTL, to Dwarf Fortress. Oh, Dwarf Fortress. Where do we even start with you? However, LTAR isn't going to cover every roguelike in existence, and it's not just going to be reviews either. It's an analysis of the genre as a whole, so don't expect every episode to cover a single game or even a single idea. There's a lot to dive into here, so we're going to be taking it bit by bit. And uh, before we begin, let me make something absolutely clear about myself. I do not claim to be good at roguelikes. I'm not even sure I can be called competent at most of them. The amount of roguelikes I've beaten can be counted on one hand. Heck, uh, maybe even one finger. But I'm a persistent son of a bitch, and when I lose at a roguelike, you can bet I'm going to be throwing myself right back into the game within seconds. I play to win, even if I rarely do. Well, now that that's out of the way, let's get down to the meat and potatoes of this episode. Rogue. Yes, Rogue, the great-grandfather of all roguelikes. The cornerstone on which the genre was built, the very first roguelike. Actually, Kevin, uh, Planet 5 was created on the Plato's operating system five years before Rogue was created, and it's considered by many to be the first dungeon crawler to ever exist. Yes, sure. Pettit 5 was around earlier, and if the 14 people who played that game want to write me nasty letters about how wrong I am and how terrible a person I am, then they can go right ahead. Look, dungeon crawlers have been around since human beings realized they could make games on computers, but only one of them has a game named after it. And, uh, it's Rogue. So, what the heck is Rogue? Well, if you're listening to this, you probably already know, but I'm gonna explain it anyway! Rogue was an ASCII-based dungeon crawler made in 1980 by Michael Toy, Kevin Arnold, and Glenn Witchman at the University of California. The goal was to proceed down a procedurally generated multi-level dungeon, steal the treasured Amulet of Yendor, and get back to the top in one piece. Inspired by Dungeons & Dragons, as well as an older computer game called the Colossal Cave Adventure, it had a heavy focus on exploration, combat, and leveling up, and it was remarkably ahead of its time. It was originally made for Unix systems. It's a Unix system. I know this. Yeah, this is a game that existed before DOS was a thing. Think about that. Hell, people were still using floppy disks that were 8 inches wide. That's the size of a frisbee. So imagine how much this game must have blown people's minds to have spread like it did. The game was a huge hit with handsome, well-adjusted college students all over America. And it spread like wildfire from system to system, being ported from one operating system to another. People absolutely loved this game, you couldn't get enough of it, and it had a massive impact on gaming. Hell, without this game we wouldn't have gotten Dwarf Fortress. And of course without Dwarf Fortress we wouldn't have gotten Minecraft. So yeah, Rogue is the reason that Minecraft exists. Kind of a big deal. Now, most computer games at the time were more akin to the choose-your-own-adventure novels than actual games, but Rogue had advanced graphics. At the time, they were the perfect mix of accessibility and hardware limitations. The game made the most of the hardware available at the time, and uh, let's see how it holds up today. Oh my god! Uh, oh god, wh what is this? <coughs> it looks more like a virus than a computer game. I'm I'm not even sure these are these are actual graphics. What is that? Is that an email? Oh, that that's me. I can move around. I guess. What is even happening? Let me break this down for you. That at symbol, that's you. Those lines, walls. Those dots, the floor. That bracket, that's our. That parenthesis over there, that's like a sword or something. Pretty much anything else, eh, probably death. Maybe a blessed cloak of invisibility. Maybe a treasure chest. But, uh, probably death. Rogue, much like Native Americans, used every part of the keyboard. Just about every character that you can create with a keyboard is used in the game to represent something. Anything that was, for instance, any exclamation point you see on the map, is gonna be a potion. And quotation marks are gonna be rings. 
To make it a little easier on the player, each variation of an item has its own color. So a blue parenthesis is one weapon, while a red parenthesis is a totally different one. Yeah, the game might look like ass to a newcomer, but an experienced player can take one look at a screenshot and see a hundred different details and facts to determine whether a run is going to be successful or not. You get used to it. I, I don't even see the code. All I see is blonde, brunette, redhead. Also, hint, it's not going to be successful. <laughs> Rogue is blisteringly hard. People have played this game for years and never beaten it. There are so many variables and so many moving parts that sometimes losing just seems like the only possible outcome. Sometimes you feel like you shouldn't have died or that your death was completely random. Worse, when you die, you lose all your progress and start from the very beginning of the game. It's frustrating and it's brutal, but it's fair, even if that fairness is brutally fair. To illustrate that, let's look at a game that almost everyone knows and understands, The Legend of Zelda. No one would argue that Zelda is an unfair game. I mean, you look at the screen, you see what's there, and you know what you need to do. Link has a variety of tools at its disposal at any given time, each of which can be used to solve puzzles or beat enemies. Zelda has very strict rules that govern all aspects of gameplay. You can move in four directions, you can use an item with one button and your sword with another. The sword is a basic attack, the item is situational. Each enemy moves in preset ways, and some are going to chase you, some are going to avoid you, and others just wander around aimlessly. Almost every aspect of that applies to Rogue. The only difference is, to steal a line from Watch Out For Fireballs, great podcast, you should check it out, your verb set. Your verb set, in relation to video games, is a way of listing the actions that a player can take at any time. Mario, for instance, has a very limited verb set. In the original Mario game, Mario can walk, run, swim, shoot fireballs, and jump. These five actions are the only ways that Mario can interact with the world around him, and the game is built around that. In Rogue, however, there's walking, searching, dropping, eating, drinking, equipping, reading, removing, zapping, wearing. Your verb set is huge, and it changes the way that you interpret the world of the game and how you approach problems. The game is difficult because it forces you to consider each problem carefully and choose the best option for each encounter. If you don't, the penalties are death and starting over. Rogue's massive verb set is perhaps one of the most distinguishing features when compared to other games of its time. The player has a vast array of options available to him, and these options were available from the very start of the game. Zelda, as we talked about before, has a verb set with a respectable amount of moving parts, but each action eventually comes down to one of two scenarios. Sword or item. Do you press the sword button, or do you press the item button? Rogue has 20 different options available at a time, and in most cases, running up to an enemy and pressing the sword button, so to speak, is the worst possible idea and a surefire way to get you killed. The reason Rogue can get away with all this complexity is because it is, at its core, a turn-based strategy game. There's no timer in Rogue, and running away is not only a viable option, it's often the only option. A winning run requires the player to patiently consider every option available to him during each turn, and spend his time leveling up and becoming more powerful. Or you could just die. <laughs> the logical extension of that is, if you die, well that's on you. You screwed up. You blew it! Early roguelike players coined the phrase YASD, which stands for Yet Another Stupid Death. It's a phrase that really sums up 99% of what playing a roguelike is. Namely, when you forget something important and make the wrong choice. Theoretically, every procedurally generated run of rogue is winnable, so if you lose, it comes down to the fact that somewhere along the way, you made the wrong choice. Maybe you decided to put on a new set of armor before checking to see whether it was cursed or not. Maybe you decided to drink an unknown potion or read an unknown spell in the middle of a battle. Maybe you were hungry and decided to eat an old food ration you found on the ground. In any case, you fucked up. You gotta deal with it. Back to the start you go. Hopefully with some new knowledge of what not to do next time. Now, this would be irritating as hell if the game wasn't so much fun to replay. Each run comes with a different dungeon layout, different items, different enemies, and different challenges for you to overcome. One important aspect of Rogue's replayability is that certain items, such as scrolls and potions, have different effects each run. A healing potion might be marked as a red potion in one run, but a green one in the next. This keeps the game from feeling stale, and allows Rogue to keep an element of unpredictability that varies from run to run, even if the player has mastered every other aspect of the game. This can also lead to quite a few YASD moments if you're not careful. So where does this leave us? 
We've got a difficult dungeon crawler with permadeath and a lot of randomization. It's a tough game, but a fair one, and at its core, it's a fun way to spend a couple of hours. I'd highly recommend taking a crack or two at Rogue, since it's hosted all over the web for free, and there are even apps for your iPhone and Android that will allow you to experience the old-school glory of the original roguelike. But how did this game spawn a genre that's quickly become one of the most popular genres in all of gaming? I mean, Steam is full of roguelikes, and Nintendo even had a hand in the Mystery Dungeon series. Roguelikes have exploded in a big way, which begs the question, what makes a roguelike a roguelike? Tune in next time to find out on Episode 2 of Let's Talk About Roguelikes. This has been Kevin, signing off.